The COVID-19 pandemic is not stopping exercises in democracy. Just days after the US vote, Myanmar is also heading to the polls. The ruling National League for Democracy Party is expected to be returned to power in the November 8 vote, but not with a landslide victory that it enjoyed back in 2015. Has the country's love and devotion for the lady waned in the last five years? In the 2015 election, the choice among majority of voters was clear. Vote for Aung San Suu Kyi. Voting for the National League for Democracy or NLD meant voting for the democratic icon. The NLD party is just one lady show. They didn't able to bring the strong... Uh, NLD is not a strong institution. If you look at the, all the Central Committee members, they are not elected by the grassroots level. They are just handpicked by the Dawn San Suu Kyi. Once in power, the strength and depth of the NLD in government were tested. So we have the Dawn San Suu Kyi, very charismatic leader. So, but we should not see she can solve all the problems of the Myanmar. But efforts to groom prominent leaders within NLD have not been particularly successful. It's a party of oldies. Her loyalists are ailing. The party faces internal issues too. Officials sacked over corruption and misconduct, disgruntled party members quitting over the years. Still, there were campaign promises to fulfil. But it made little progress on bringing peace to the country. And the biggest promise yet unfulfilled is in changing the 2008 constitution written by the Myanmar army. This would allow a civilian government to have full control of parliament without the army's veto power. constitution <laughs> Despite these challenges, the NLD has had some success. Among them, electrification. Half of Myanmar now has access to power, up from just one-third when NLD took office. Despite the limited achievements, NLD can still depend on Ms. Suji to bring in the votes. I'm really proud of my ladies. I want to spot for my country, yeah, and then I want to spot for our ladies. Most important thing is Myanmar people are still loving Dong San Suu Kyi and they want to give her another chance. Perhaps it won't be unconditional love. This time round, voters would likely want to see more promises delivered by the NLD government. Myanmar will have some 5 million first-time voters in the upcoming polls. Now that's one-eighth of the total electorate. How much sway will they have over the vote? It's great to be young. For them, they'll have a long road ahead, a future that's theirs to chart. Since I was young, I always wanted to be a responsible citizen uh, that do good for the country. So uh, being one of those voters makes me feel like uh, I can let my voices to be heard. And yeah, also, uh, I think I can accomplish my duty as a good citizen. Indeed, a lot is at stake for young voters. Of 37 million voters this time, 5 million have just turned 18, Myanmar's legal voting age. 5 million. It's a big number. And then these people are also important and they want to vote for the first time in their life because this is the way, you know, they, they are recognized as the adult in the political system. So people, many people are excited to show that, you know, their votes. Myanmar is generally a young country. Its median age is 29, a good 10 years younger than countries like Thailand and Singapore. Despite that, not all parties have a clear agenda for young people. 
there are nearly 100 political parties vying for votes this election. But it's a different story for the ruling National League for Democracy Party and the country's main opposition, Union Solidarity Development Party. Both have a sizable number of young members and are now tapping them to attract votes. Such effort may prove useful at the upcoming polls. Driven by their own aspirations, youths are likely to be more critical when casting their vote. In the last 2015 elections, experts say the choice for voters was clear. It was either Misuchi's NLD party, which represents democracy, or the USDP, which many see as being controlled by the Myanmar army. This time though, the NLD has admitted voter behaviour has changed, and it doesn't expect people to cast their vote without much thought first. Young people who have uh, very certain and definitive views of how they want to shape their future. And again, because of the immediacy of uh, information that they can get on what's going around in the world, uh, they do have a lot more, uh, I think, comparative uh, uh, capacity as well as options as, say, um, their parents or even their, their elder brothers and sisters did in, in darker days. This could well be something Misuchi herself can understand. Having once been a young voter and democracy fighter, she's put much time, effort and work into changing Myanmar's future. Myanmar heads to the polls this Sunday amidst one of Southeast Asia's worst COVID-19 outbreaks and a souring economy. The World Bank has estimated Myanmar's GDP to grow by just 0.5% this year. Will it cast a shadow on State Council Aung San Suu Kyi's party in the vote? It hasn't exactly been a smooth journey for these villagers who live on the outskirts of capital Naypyidaw. They're among half of the 54 million population in Myanmar who are still without access to electricity. But that's an improvement. In 2016, when the National League for Democracy or NLD took office, only one third of Myanmar had electricity. One of NLD government's early priorities was electrification. But more is needed to power up the economy. You know, if we look at Myanmar's economy over the last five years, what we see is consistently high economic growth. Um, now, I think there can be arguments about whether it was high enough and how close it was to Myanmar's maximum potential. The NLD government had its hands full dealing with other priorities, charting the peace process and rewriting Myanmar's constitution. Soon, the business community, both local and foreign investors, grew impatient. I think um, things that they are unhappy about is the slow pace of reform. It's very hard to get skilled labour in Myanmar. The NLD's uh, economic reforms have not been as visible as, say, their predecessors. In 2017, the Rohingya humanitarian crisis broke. That sparked new problems for government, dealing with accusations of genocide. The West threatened economic sanctions and tourists shunned Myanmar. Early this year, China pushed for its Belt and Road Initiative projects in Myanmar. But shortly after, the COVID-19 pandemic struck. Despite Myanmar's limited resources, Misuchi's team quickly pulled together an economic package worth $2 billion. The plan is meant to cover all bases, from boosting tie-ups with private companies and cutting interest rates, to helping farmers and stocking up food for the country. Surely there will be recollections of what the uh, government has done in terms of uh, trying to put forth economic policies since it took office in 2016. But um, of course the most recent events or the most recent developments will be topmost in voters' minds. 
but Myanmar's road to economic success is just at the halfway mark. Misuchi's economic advisor Sean Turnell says it will take Myanmar 10 years for it to develop into its full potential. I think in this second five-year period, and so if, for instance, the current government was re-elected, I think at that time we would see the consolidation and the advance of a lot of the reforms that have been put in place in that first. New technology to spray pesticides over vast fields and using the drone to conduct agricultural land surveys. That's what one Thai business has sold to Myanmar earlier this year. It's waiting to deliver 10 more of such drones after COVID-19 travel restrictions are lifted. In the two or three years, uh, I think it's far because commercial law, so I can open business in Myanmar. I open three companies in Myanmar because the commercial law is quite open for the open for foreigners can open business and joint venture with Myanmar. I think this one is good. Since the National League for Democracy came to power in Myanmar in 2015, it introduced a number of initiatives to bolster confidence among foreign investors and attract more international investments into the country. These include introducing a new investment law in 2016 and a new Companies Act. Rewadi has already invested more than 32,000 US dollars into Myanmar over the last seven months and she hopes to at least double her investments on an annual basis. But many other investors, including her, have told me that they're hoping that the Myanmar government will be able to come up with better business rules and regulations and define a clearer economic path forward for the country. Some Thai entrepreneurs feel that Myanmar has not paid enough attention to its investment policies over the last five years. They hope that'll change after the elections as they believe the country still possesses many business opportunities. We want to invest there, right? We want to set up the company, we want to have some, some entity there. If they can give us more flexibility to have those uh, investment, I mean, easier, uh, we, we do business, we can bring the money back easier, something like that, that would, that would be great. According to this year's World Bank Ease of Doing Business report, Myanmar comes in at 165 out of 190 nations. Although it improved six spots up from 171 in 2018, it's still among the least favourable places in ASEAN to do business. The political climate appears to be a cause of uneasiness among businesses. Myanmar has been riddled with negative news from the Rohingya humanitarian crisis to the ongoing armed conflicts in its ethnic states. We have a lot of investors in Thailand and I know all of them is still scared for investing in Myanmar. Still not comfortable, should be not secure for this political in June, the World Bank has downgraded Myanmar's economic forecast from 6.8% in FY 2018-2019 to just 0.5% this financial year. But Myanmar appears to be ready as it prepares to draw up policies to recover from the poor economy after COVID-19. In the last fiscal year of 2018-2019, the authority said the country received about four billion US dollars worth of foreign direct investments. Thailand, with Myanmar investments in sectors like energy and manufacturing, is among the top three investors in Myanmar behind Singapore and China. Some Rohingyas voted in Myanmar's 2010 elections but were banned in the last polls in 2015 as they were deemed illegal migrants and not citizens of Myanmar. In this upcoming election, they will once again be excluded from the vote, causing anger and despair, as my colleague Mei Wong reports. He's 18 years old this year the eligible voting age in this year's Myanmar elections. But Sayadola will not be able to vote because he's an ethnic Rohingya. Sayadola fled his home in Rakhine State in 2017 to Bangladesh after the brutal security forces cracked down. It means, it means this is the first time that uh, uh, I am legally, first time uh, I have tough to vote. But, uh, you know, it's making me very frustrated. Uh, because because our government they denied 
you know, but then all the Rohingya people, so including me, because I'm also Rohingya, if any candidate going to rule us, I mean to rule our country, at that time it is our right and it's our duty to select our, you know, uh, with our interest to select anyone to rule us, to govern us. So, but unfortunately we have not this right. About one million Rohingyas live in refugee camps in Bangladesh. Myanmar doesn't consider them citizens and doesn't acknowledge their ethnicity, instead identifying them as Bengalese. Some of these Rohingyas have written to the Myanmar government and made public pleas for authorities to reconsider their decisions and allow them to partake in the polls. That government position will unlikely change. Even Rohingyas who wanted to stand as candidates have been rejected. I was born in Myanmar. I was the citizenship of the Myanmar. I was also a part of the Myanmar. If they didn't give a chance, how will they solve the Rohingya crisis? They are not willing to solve the Rohingya crisis. We don't want to live here in, under the tabulin. Refugee life is very typical. But nobody didn't hear our voice. Our hope is with international community. Our hope is not with Aung San Suu Kyi. Rohingyas have been living in the Bangladesh refugee camps for three years now. Myanmar says it will allow those who are verified to return to Rakhine. But repatriating the Rohingyas, observers believe, is not a priority for Myanmar. There's no sympathy for the Rohingyas among the, the majority of Burmans at all. The whole Rohingya issue has sort of changed the political games and political alliances in Myanmar to an extent which probably no one had expected a couple of years ago. Because until the, the Rohingya exodus, Aung San Suu Kyi was the darling of the West. The pro-democracy icon, everybody loved her. But the Rohingya crisis changed all that. The Rohingya issue will continue to be a major challenge for Myanmar and the government. The government had gone before the International Court of Justice to defend itself against accusations of genocide. In a rare admission, Aung San Suu Kyi said war crimes may have been committed, but rejected genocidal actions. Almost a year has passed since the hearing at The Hague. Today, Rohingyas who remain inside Myanmar are still not able to move around freely or leave the camps without permission. Education and healthcare access remain limited for this community. With no end in sight to the current conditions and without any parliamentary representations, it will be a long time before the Rohingyas will ever learn if they have a place or be counted as one among the Myanmar society. These may look like ordinary homes in a rural village, except they're not. The occupants are Myanmar refugees, majority ethnic Karen, who aren't allowed to leave the compound as they're watched 24-7. Of some 80,000 refugees in Thailand, almost half of them are aged 18 and below. These are children most likely born inside a refugee camp like this. This is Mela Camp, one of nine located along the Thai-Myanmar border. Unfortunately, these kids probably will only know of a lifestyle inside a refugee camp being a refugee. At this stage, they seem unlikely and unable to get back to Myanmar. Zozo, who has been living as a refugee in Thailand for 15 years. Have fear expressed uh, what to get out of here, but I can't. You want to go home? No. Why? I will go to Bangkok. Many problems. I don't want to go. What problems? Kuwa, Kuwa. But our conversation was abruptly cut short. After a while, the Thai authorities are not allowing us to step outside of the van to video this camp anymore. But I just want to point out to you that back in 2012, before Aung San Suu Kyi was governing Myanmar, she visited this Mela camp occupied by Myanmar refugees, mainly from the bordering state of Karen. And at that time, she was quoted as saying, for our people to return, we must provide them with peace and prosperity. 
Although 10 ethnic armed groups have already signed the nationwide ceasefire agreement, citizens are still experiencing periodic fighting and some breaches of the pact. The government has been trying to encourage more to join the agreement, but many ethnic armed groups are hesitant as they're not convinced the national military will honour the pact. Sisiwa managed to get special permission from the Thai authorities to live outside of the refugee camp for a temporary period of time. She came to a Thai refugee camp when she was only about five years old. I don't want to see my next generation or my younger and brother sister to feel like me. Maybe if they grow up, they will feel like me. No one, no one cares there. No one know that they are illegal in the world. Last year, fewer than 3,000 refugees have returned home, most of them voluntarily and risking their lives. To create a conducive and safe environment for refugees to return to Myanmar, help organizations say the government must first develop a policy dealing with refugees. There is no refugee policy in Myanmar. There's no central policy about refugee return. So although we are seeing people going back, um, most people are going back into areas where it is rural subsistence agriculture. Um, there is very little opportunity in the way of livelihoods. Sisuwa agrees, saying her 69-year-old grandmother is resigned to the fact that she'll most unlikely be able to return home to Myanmar and will spend the rest of her life in the refugee camp. Like my grandmother told me, if I die in refugee, maybe I will die. But I don't want you to see you still living in refugee. One day, you, I think, if you have education, maybe you can change. So she, she, my grandma told me, I cannot give you money, I cannot give you power. Just I give you knowledge and the education, study yourself and then see what is going on the, the world. Still, the lady's grip on power looks as strong as ever, even as questions remain over whether she'll deliver more of her promises this time round.